version of Rare. Hello and welcome to Rare. Throughout Ireland, graveyards have always been places of mystery, of pishogues and stories passed on about haunted souls on these sacred sites. This 1968 Warg film looks at some of the burial customs and traditions particular to Cork. Burials and burial places have always been surrounded with special reverence and solemnity. In Ireland, each district has its traditional ways of honouring the memory of the dead, and these traditions can be strong even in the cities. Rise again, but we shall not all be changed. The trump will sound and the dead will rise again free from corruption. In Cork City and the surrounding districts, the funeral service is quite different from anywhere else in the country and has been so for longer than people can remember. When this corruptible nature wears his incorruptible garment, the priest goes in front of the coffin the whole way from the church to the graveyard, wearing a white sash over one shoulder in place of the customary black or purple stole. The selection of prayers and readings is unique to Cork, and is said to have been composed by a Capuchin father in penal times. Even when the rest of the church was using Latin in its funeral rite, these prayers were being said in the vernacular in the city and diocese of Cork. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has given to the Son too to have life in himself, and he has granted him power also to render judgment, since he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the time cometh when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come forth. Those whose actions have been good rise into a new life, and those whose lives have been evil rise into meet their sentence. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, from the gates of hell. May he rest in peace. O Lord, hear my prayer. Prayer for the brief. O Lord Jesus Christ, God of all consolation, thyself once moved even unto tears at the grave of thy friend Lazarus. Look now with compassion, we beseech thee, unto those who mourn at this grave. Comfort them in their affliction, breathe into their hearts the spirit of resignation to thy holy will, and with abundance of grace inspire in them and in all who mourn the firm resolution so to live here that hereafter them they may be reunited with their own, where death shall be no more, nor mourning, nor crying, nor sorrow, be union with thee, who live as the reign is forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Funerals in Cork often take place in the afternoon. The Mass is said in the morning, but the actual burial may not be carried out until later in the day. It obviously goes back to a more leisured age when people were prepared to devote a whole day to the memory of a departed friend. Father, you have some unusual funeral customs here. The obvious one is the one of wearing this white sash. What's the idea behind it? Well, it goes back very far. Uh, there is no proper account of its origin. Um, we never call it a sash. It's only the outsiders call it a sash. Uh, it's always known as a cypress. I'm not sure of the spelling, but I think it's the same as the tree. The no, the tree, yeah. cypress, you know. Yeah. Now, cypresses, I think, were always associated with funerals, yeah. and I think they were used yeah. at funerals. And why the word was applied to this sash, I don't know. Cypress. Why, the, why is it worn now? Simply because it was worn in the past. And uh, it probably was a form of stole, like the priest wears around his, over his um, shoulders. And I take it there was also something corresponding to the maniple. Uh, one view is that it goes to the penal days uh, when a priest had to get rid of his um, vestments quickly and this was easily got rid of, you see, and, and uh, yeah. folded up and you disappear over the, uh, the hillside. But uh, it is in this diocese of Cork and also in, uh, in Ross. Uh, when we had the horses long ago, you know, and the carriages, uh, the uh, men driving the hearse wore a white band around their hat as well as a sash. Uh, as well as a cypress uh, over their arms. Well, do you provide this for yourself, or uh, is it provided for you? It's provided for us. And uh, a different one for each funeral? <laughs> a different one for each funeral. Um, we give them sometimes to friends, sometimes to sisters to make clothes for First Communion, but nowadays they're getting pretty well off and they don't, they don't need them the same way. The sash may go sooner. What about keening? Is there any keening at funerals now? Um, a few years ago, I had it right across there. What exactly happens? What do the, the keeners do? Well, uh, 
this poor lad had died in St. Vincent's Hostel, I remember at the time, and uh, um, a relative who never uh, recognised him when he was alive was waiting for me here. And as I approached, she said, oh, here are the crawthumpers coming now. And she started then this display. She said, ah, Jackie, she said, you're down with them all tonight. Ah, to see you left the cold grave tonight, you know. Went on and on in this sing-song. And uh, she, I, I was, my voice was drowned when the prayers began, you know. And, well, this uh, was kind of talking to the dead relatives, is that the idea? To the dead relatives and to the man who was going down with them. They had, she had nicknames then on the various people. But then they retired later on down there behind that ruin, you see. And um, it wasn't altogether to say their prayers. They went down there. I take it they gave a few glasses to the... <laughs> Do you remember that day? <laughs> yes, we had it, we had it all right. That, that's the man uh, doing the grave there. Uh, yeah. So, um, well, Keening has died out now. It has. It? It's a kind of a sing song, mm. you know. Uh, um, that's not so long ago though. It's only about five years, I think. Oh, about five or six years. Not too far back at all. And we had a few tears, half tearses, I think, before we left below. Before we left the, the, the um, somewhere in the marsh, anyway. I won't say any more. What's a half tears? Half tears. You don't know, you mean to say you don't know why a man down from Guinness is <laughs> dear. <laughs> Glory. Half tears is the, you know, they used to have them at the trashings for the porter, you know. Uh, it, is, it is a kind of a timber barrel, I suppose they're all gone, a wooden barrel for holding a mm -hmm. stout mm -hmm. drink, mm -hmm. uh, porter. A harmless drink, really. <laughs> this cemetery, St. Mary's, is situated at a place called the Curragh. It's the kind of place where stories and legends seem to grow and flourish as abundantly as the grass that pushes its way up between the headstones. The local people claim, for instance, that this cemetery was the scene of both the longest and the shortest funeral in the world. The longest was the funeral of a Cork-born explorer who died on an expedition in the Arctic and was brought back from the North Pole to be buried here in the Curra. And the shortest was that of a woman living in the cemetery gate lodge who was said to have been lifted straight out of the window of her bedroom into her grave. The cemetery is now old and overcrowded. The long lists of names on the headstones give some indication of the number of people who have found their last resting place in these graves. The city has one municipal cemetery, St. Finbar's, but there is also in Cork a peculiar attachment to small local graveyards like this one, the Curra. This instinct of being buried one among own is very strong here in Cork, and despite the fact that some of these little graveyards are hopelessly overcrowded, burials continue to take place here where father and grandfather went before. In this grave lies the body of a young Cork lady who was well known for her great love of the poor. Despite the fact that she came from a prominent Cork family, she asked that at her death her body would be buried here among the people that she knew and loved. But her husband wanted the best for his young wife, and so he had her body brought to St. Finbar's. The story here in the locality, and it's very strong, is that she continually appeared to him to remind him of her request until such time as he had the body taken from St. Finbar's and brought up here to the Curra. Whatever the truth this may be, the fact is that the body was exhumed after six months, was brought from St. Finbar's up here, and now rests under this imposing monument in the Curragh. An even more bizarre story is told about another Cork cemetery, the little graveyard at Motteha. In the centre of the plot, completely covered by ivy, stands the gable end of an old church, long since replaced by the newer one across the road. According to local legend, the graves around the old church were once two miles away at Loch On. But one night, the dead arose and crossed over the valley to Mateha here, carrying their gravestones on their backs and reburied themselves around the old church. Once upon a time, there was a, a priest in in Matahe in the chapel, and uh, he was giving mass. And the uh, Englishman, he came along, and he ready had sent him into the chapel, and he he went up to the priest, and and he cut off his head. And he went away, and all the all the people were trying to stop him, and all like, and he cut off his head, and he went, he he went, uh, he got his horse, and he went, he was riding on this hill, Fox's Bridge Hill. Fox was the man's name, and he was riding down the hill there, and there was a small terrier that came out over the ditch, and he he cut the horse by the heel, and the horse bolted and fired him off. And he was, uh, he was, uh, he was killed there above at the garden, I believe, there, in the hill there. 
And after he'd been killed anyway, the, the people buried him over in the graveyard in Lacan. And when he was uh, when he was buried, uh, he was buried anyway. He all the uh, all the rest of the graves were moved during the night. Why was that? I I don't know. I don't know what I heard like. And how, how and what did you hear actually? How how did they move? That they all they were all gone in the morning, and they came across the bridge there. You know the new bridge now below. Yeah. And there was the printed two feet up on the on the stone like. And how did these, what were these prints supposed to be? They were supposed to be the people that were gone, like that they were barefooted and that they were walking across the river. And there was a piece of a hitch on, fell into the river. There was a piece of a hitch on, I didn't see the hitch down, but there was a piece of it fell into the river, supposed to be at the fall into the river, and, uh, and the rest of them, uh, uh, he stepped over alone, what was supposed to stop there alone, this man fox. And is his headstone still over there? I couldn't tell you about the hitch on, but the signs of the graves are there, like. Yeah. Well, did, are the people supposed to have carried the headstones with them as they went over? Oh, they were, yes. Well, the story is that they actually got up out of their graves and they, walked across. Uh, they got up out of the graves and walked across. Do you believe that? I, I don't. <laughs> do people around believe it? God knows there's a lot of people do. The footprints and pieces of headstones said to have been left in the river by the grisly procession are no longer to be seen. But above at Loch On, there is still the remains of what might well be an old graveyard, with hollows like abandoned graves and a solitary stone, the so-called soldier stone, in the centre. In the distance, one can see the trays of Mateha, a good night's walk for any corpse, especially when carrying a headstone. Another explanation, and one which imposes less strain on the imagination, is that the local people were so incensed at the thought of having this heretic buried among their own dead, that one night to a man, they lifted up all the bodies, brought them across the river and up the valley, and reburied them here at Ma Tehe, the plain of the flight. And what more suitable place could they have chosen than this, the site of the original sacrilege, the old mass house? Most funerals in Cork today are to the large municipal cemetery of St. Finbars. As cemeteries go, St. Finbars is a comparative newcomer on the Cork scene, but it's old enough to hold quite a lot of history within its walls. Among those buried here are many leaders of the struggle for independence, including Terence McSweeney, the Lord Mayor of Cork who died on hunger strike in a London prison. The orderly layout of St. Finbars is in marked contrast to the picturesque confusion of the older graveyards. These used to have a single rough gravel path running beside the boundary wall. And the custom was to carry the coffin right around the whole circumference of the cemetery before committing it to the grave. In a cemetery as large as St. Finbar's, this is no longer possible. And there's a network of regular pathways to bring the mourners straight to the graveside. One thing that remains unchanged, however, is the devotion of the people towards their dead. This young family, who recently lost their father, come each week to pray at his grave. There has not yet been time to put up a permanent headstone, but for today, they have brought with them a wooden cross to act as a temporary memorial. For many years, there was one odd man out among the cemeteries of Cork. This was the cemetery at Carr's Hole, an old pauper's graveyard, a short distance outside the city on the Douglas Road. Bill Sorensen, who is a taxi driver, passed it often and never forgot to say a prayer for those who were buried here. But it worried him that so many of his fellow citizens should be lying in unmarked graves in an unmarked graveyard. And he began to visit the place regularly and to inquire into its history. He traced out the outlines of the pits where the poor were buried during the Great Famine without benefit of shroud or coffin, and he decided it was about time they received a suitable monument. The monument took the form of a steel cross, more than 50 feet high, and he built every bit of it himself with his own two hands. What gave you the idea first of building this cross here at Carr's Hole? Well, I'm a lover of the poor people. That's the idea. And are they all poor people who are buried here? Oh, God love us, should they have nothing to do. What is it? I've been hungry in my life, and I know what it is for the, to, keep, to, to go out without food, or to be without a drink of water. 
How is it that they were buried here without so much as a headstone for the lot of them? Oh, God, I couldn't answer that question. I suppose it was the times. Sure, the whole world was the same. I think Ireland was more different than the rest of them. Are there many people buried here? I'd say, I think, up to, well, they said 5,000, but I think they reckon about some of them must be about 10,000 people buried here. Well, would all these people have been paupers? Oh, God, yes, I'd say there would be. If you'd, this is no man's land, as they call it. Uh, it was known as Potter's Field, and they changed it over to uh, uh, Carl's Hall, and then they called it All Saints Cemetery, but it is a nice way to look after all the saints. <laughs> How did you go about getting the cross and getting it up? Well, my experience with the telephone company that uh, I was only just going to put up an armory telephone pole with a cross arm on it, and uh, the time went by, and I concentrated, and I had five crosses in mind, two wooden crosses, and two steel crosses, and a concrete cross. Mm. So I fixed on the idea of putting up this one because I could do the job myself, and I started off then making it across in the garden, and <laughs> my wife started kicking up a dust <laughs> about a graveyard, and my son also. This is are you crazy? Are you mad? I know. He says, are you mad? He says, the whole bloody world is mad. <laughs> but he says, I'm going to carry on with the cross, and you And I carried on, and this is where it finished up. You mean you made this whole 60-foot cross in oh, the back garden? No, yes, but I didn't make it at all. God made it, I think. <laughs> I, I'm sure of that. I'm sure of that because I had no difficulty. You were in the army. Did your army experience help you in any way in this kind of work? Oh, God, yes, it did. Because, I mean, to say, when any fellow was buried, the first thing they did was they put up a little wooden cross, or the, when they couldn't get across, they, they, they stuck his rifle and bayonet into the ground, and then they put the tin hat on top of it, and they, they tied the, the label of the body and around the cross. So there was always some recognition. Oh, there was them, always right? something of that sort of stuff. But uh, fancy. <coughs> coming over to your hair and, and, and seeing all the people that was buried here without no mark at all, whatever. And you could look from the road and you'd see nothing on the, on the plot of ground. There's nobody know this graveyard, only the people, the old people in the days gone by. The cross has now been standing in Carr's Hole for 10 years, but Mr. Sorensen still looks after it as carefully as though it had only just been erected. He'll be 77 on his next birthday, but he can still climb up and down the cross as quickly and as nimbly as a 10-year-old. In order to make the cross visible by night as well as by day, he has outlined its shape with electric light bulbs, and he frequently makes the trip to the top to check that everything is in working order. Despite appearances to the contrary, Bill Sorensen knows that he's getting old and that his time is beginning to run out. But this doesn't bother him at all. Indeed, he says that he's looking forward to meeting a lot of old friends up above the nameless men and women who are buried in Carr's Hole. A short while ago, Cork's first funeral home was opened, the latest development in the changing pattern of funeral customs. A funeral home is not just an undertaker's office. It's an adaptation of the American funeral parlor, which is so familiar to Irish Americans, and it aims to provide a complete funeral service with everything in the best possible taste. find it's necessary. People do like to see what they're getting, strangely enough, at funerals. Uh, well, of course, by the time they want it, they're not in a position to see, really, are they? <laughs> That's true. But the family is concerned. They usually like to, to uh, see a coffin or whatever they, they intend to choose. Usually they don't uh, go for anything as elaborate or as expensive. That's a tremendous this. thing. This we keep for American people who die in this country, visitors and that, you know, it's very elaborate and quite expensive. How much, actually? The start at, uh, this one over here starts at 180 and this one is around 250 and this is, I think, roughly 290. What's the advantage of a, of a coffin like that as opposed to the ordinary timber one? 
Well, this is all steel, Father, and, um, well, I suppose it's very elaborate, it's a very beautiful looking thing, you know, really, isn't it? And um, this is the, the type of thing they expect in America. Yeah. So you can see yourself, it's beautifully finished with velvet and what have you. And, and very soft. Yes. Uh, cushion and all. But this really isn't the purpose. Uh, the, we'd like you to see this casket, but actually what we do when we bring people in here is to counsel them, because we find very often people want to spend much more money than they can afford on, on funerals. And at this stage, we know exactly what they're committed to, and we can tell them exactly. We like to So you bring people. them on a little tour around? Yes, the and talk to them and try and explain as well as we can. So um, we find this a very useful room. Well, what exactly happens in, in this room here, where the coffin is and the and the receipt is laid Could out? I go back a little bit yes. further? And uh, the reason really is that, uh, why do we have this room? Because, well, most removals take place from either mortuaries of hospitals and that like that are were never designed for the purpose there. They're just there as a place to hold the person just for the time being. You might have maybe 100, 200 people coming along there in, un, if you like, unacceptable conditions. We, we, we see this and... Uh, you mean cold like, and uninviting? Cold and miserable, really, yeah. you know? And uh, also, the modern homes, flats, apartments, uh, you just haven't the facility. So uh, we decided that this was necessary. You can see here we have plenty of space. It's comfortable. It's centrally located. It's easy to get to. and. Uh, well, um, I, I think the whole thing is that it has been accepted very readily by the people we look after. So the remains you know. will come here, will be coffined here, and then visitors or friends or relatives can come in and sit During around and During the day, chat. from say 10 o'clock in the morning until we usually, well, we, we are very flexible about this, but till about 9 o'clock. Do you think, envisage you know? this mainly as a social event then? Uh, oh, not social, but no, making things easier for the family and for relatives. If, for example, a person is at home, fine, they can go and visit and say a prayer, but in the hospitals this isn't possible. Mm -hmm. Are you replacing the old traditional wake by this are you going to does this mean that the, the remains will no longer stay in the house but will be taken exactly. here straight away yes and we provide a 24 hour service we have men available at all times of person dies two three four or five o'clock in the morning well, what was wrong with the old-fashioned wake idea i mean people like to have the body in their home didn't they uh, yes father but it was very difficult uh, i'm sure you um have perhaps had a close relative who has died and and uh, Maybe they've had four, five, six weeks of person dying, and um, it's, it's, a fair, it's a dreadfully and a very, very difficult time for them. And we feel that this takes sort of the, fit and the burden of meeting them, physically meeting their friends, catering for them, making tea and all this sort of thing, you know? Whereas they can come here and meet them, and uh, the friends can come here uh, more conveniently for themselves as well, and pay their respects. And uh, I, we find, anyway, that it's, um, it's much easier for people all around, you know? Well, the Irish wake has a fairly riotous tradition. Do you ex anticipate any... Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, well, well... You'll serve a cup of tea here. Will you serve anything stronger? Uh, I don't think so, Father, no. <laughs> no. It's lighting up time in Cork, and the Douglas Road is beginning to fill with homeward-bound traffic. Above, on the hill at Carr's Hole, it's lighting up time also. The falling darkness hides the gaunt metal of the cross, and one sees only its outline in lights, shining the message of hope in the resurrection and respect for the memory of the dead.